Course objective, we're going to learn about STC and NRC, especially understanding those differences as they pertain to building design. Uh, sound blocking and sound absorption are very different, and we'll learn that throughout. Uh, we'll talk about a few other things, such as code requirements, IBC, ANSI, LEED version 4, and the most efficient ways to, to reach those target ratings that those codes require. So here's a little overview. This is how we like to break down noise issues in general. They can fall into one of three categories in terms of mitigation. Uh, it's either a soundproofing issue, an acoustics or sound absorption issue, or a speech privacy sound masking issue. When we say soundproofing, we're talking about blocking noise between rooms, between adjacencies. Uh, this could be a mechanical room next to a classroom. It could be two residential units next to each other. But this is where you're going to find your STC and IIC ratings, and we'll jump into that right now. <clears throat> Soundproofing can be broken down into structure-borne and airborne. Now, to solve structural, the best thing to do is to decouple the structure, meaning Structure-to-structure -structure contact will induce vibration, um, and it will create sound energy, will pass right through it. Um, airborne is what we think about with walls. The best way to solve airborne sound issues is to add mass to the wall. Um, you may have heard of these ratings, IIC and STC. IIC is the impact insulation class. This is mostly floor assemblies, unless you're elbowing a wall or something like that. Uh, a wall really only needs to block airborne noise. These may be some common terms you've heard. Uh, soundproofing is the same as attenuation, is the same as transition loss. Uh, the goal is to reduce noise from one area to the next, whether, like we said, that's between units, between rooms. And we can break that down into three categories, three principles, really. Mass law, which we talked about adding mass. Decoupling, which we talked about removing that structure-to-structure -structure contact. And the 1% rule. So the mass law, pretty simple, um, pretty intuitive. Uh, the, the amount of sound passing through a medium is inversely proportional to the mass of that medium meaning the more mass you have, the more sound attenuation you have. But that's not the whole story. The issue with that is there are marginal returns, um, marginal benefits with just adding mass. And when I say adding mass, I'm mostly referring to uh, common architectural practices such as adding multiple layers of drywall to a wall um, or, or other ways to quote-unquote beef it up. You can see in this chart, this is from Architectural Acoustics by um, David Egan. We're looking at some concrete partitions here. Notice in the chart, we go from 3 inches to 6 inches to 12 inches. We're doubling that mass every time. The problem is our STC is only jumping from 42 to 46, from 46 to 51. You know, that's, a, that's about a delta of about 6 average. So think how inefficient it would be um, to go from a 6-inch wall to a 24 wall and, and only add 12 points of STC. Uh, it really shows you kind of the diminishing returns you do get by just adding mass. Decoupling is an issue. Um, all things being equal, a flexible boundary will absorb structure-borne sound and prevent it from traveling through uh, more than a stiff or rigid boundary. Um, now this is critical for stiff studs. The, these images here represent many different things you can do with wood studs. Uh, if you're looking from left to right, um, you know, this is a, a weak soundproof wall to, to a strong soundproof wall. And these are the architectural decisions you can make. Uh, a single stud wall, when you have drywall on both sides, that's, that's a coupled condition. Uh, the drywall is touching the studs on both sides, um, and it's very susceptible to vibration energy passing through. 
Now, one thing you can do is decouple that from both sides to just one, stop, one side. We recommend a staggered stud wall. It does require more studs, but it is much more efficient in that it's a more flexible boundary uh, because the drywall is only coupled on one side of the wall. Even better than that is a double stud wall with a one to two inch air gap would be your most efficient, but again, you are creating a double stud wall. There's a lot of structure there. Another thing we like to talk about is resilient channel. Resilient channel is a good way to decouple mass from a structure um, under the right conditions. We like to recommend it for the stiffest studs, such as wood studs. We don't recommend it for 25 gauge, um, even 20 gauge sometimes. And that's because in the field, installation of resilient channel uh, can be an issue. Um, most lab tests involve RC Deluxe channel, and we'll see contractors buying RC1 channel. Um, Another issue is you can't hang heavy cabinets, TVs, that kind of thing on the side of the wall with resilient channel because that will add blocking and ground the structure. All the way on the left you'll see one common mistake is contractors, and I'll get my mouse over here, will <clears throat> install the resilient channel first from channel to stud and then they will install the drywall after and they'll often blast their drywall screw through the decoupled resilient channel and straight into the stud. If you do that about four times, you're really coupling the structure and ruining all the benefits from resilient channel. Because keep in mind, resilient channel is not adding mass. We're just decoupling existing mass. So if you mess up the decoupling, then you're kind of, you're lost in the water. And we've been out there in the field. Um, we we were on a job site looking at a job that did have resilient channel installed, and, and we did notice a lot of key issues uh, w with this. Um, you'll see resilient channel is 99% of the time designed to be 24 inches on center so that it is as flexible as it can be. And we've seen contractors using resilient channel to support their electrical backboards or, or just use use it really for the, the structure of the stud wall, how, how they see fit. Um, as you can see, I, I pop my mouse up and down. This is about a 10 inch, 10 inch gap between these channels. It should be 24 inch. Um, so those are some things when you're designing it, but you can't control it. Another thing with resilient channel, they'll cut it in the field. They're supposed to attach it in these template holes you can see by my mouse here. Well, when they're cutting it to specific lengths, that doesn't necessarily line up on these template holes. So they will screw in, they'll create a new hole, and this creates a very stiff resilient channel. Um, we were pulling on this channel in the field. It was very stiff. It just felt like it was part of the stud, not the flexible decoupling element you expect. And on the bottom right here, this... Um, looks like a sloppy splicing condition uh, in the field. Maybe we'd prefer these channels to butt up against the stud and share the stud that way. Let's move on to the 1% rule. This is where you can think of soundproofing like waterproofing. Um, a 1% opening allows 50% of the sound through. A 5% opening allows 90% of the sound through. These are rules of thumb. And the point is it's very critical to seal leaky edges and to address all boundary conditions on a project. Uh, maybe you've heard the term flanking path before. This is what we call a spacer gap or structure to structure contact that allows sound to pass through. So what are we talking about with leaks? Well, doors. Make sure to have sweeps and, and seals on doors um, at the bottom of it and in the middle. We always recommend solid core doors um, over lighter doors. Another thing that comes into play is electrical outlets. One key thing to do is to stagger electrical outlets in different stud cavities. You don't want one side of the wall 
and the other side of the wall to have the same stud cavity because that is a clear direct uh, path for sound to travel through uh, almost like you're looking at this um, culvert here. So putty pads on the back of outlets and staggering them between stud cavities will homogenize and muffle the sound enough that that it will dissipate before it leaves the other side of the outlet. Another thing to consider, walls going to deck, that's very important. Um, sound can just travel over the wall and into the next room if the walls aren't going to deck. I know that sounds pretty simple, but we see this application a lot um, in the medical field. Um, exam room walls actually have high standards for sound transmission class, but we'll often see um, <clears throat> medical facilities having those walls not go to deck or having these kind of shared patient rooms with very small partitions or even just light curtains in between patients. So these are all things to think about um, when, when designing around flanking paths and leaks. The point is, look for the weakest link in the space, and oftentimes that is the easiest and cheapest solution. And that's because sound will follow the path of least resistance. Um, <clears throat> doors and windows, for example, are usually that particular path. We always recommend double pane windows. We recommend solid core doors. Um, because this contributes to a composite STC. Most demising walls between units are, are pretty cut and dry. There aren't windows in each unit. They're, um, you know, they're very straight line walls that don't have, you know, windows or doors or other flanking paths that interrupt them. Um, when you do have these exterior doors with windows, with, with doors, you may have designed the rest of that wall as an STC 50, but you have to look at the composite STC, which are equations that we calculate to determine the total transmission loss when you factor in what percentage of this wall is a door or window versus what percentage of this wall is my good STC 50 design. You relate those into equation and then you may get something closer to an STC 40 type of wall. Um, and just to reiterate flanking, you know, you could have a 12 inch thick stainless, stainless steel wall, right? But if you have, if it doesn't go to deck or if, if you aren't caulking the baseboards at the bottom of it, sound will travel through those openings as if you're in, in the same room.